from my perspective, um, you know, a socialized dog is a dog that can tolerate and be around anything and not react to it. That's the biggest thing and one of the biggest problems I see people have is, you know, they say, your dog's not socialized because it's aggressive towards other animals. Just like with people, you know, some dogs aren't good at getting along with any other dogs. One of the most common things you see people do is they tell them to shut up. A dog doesn't know what shut up means. You haven't taught them to, to cease barking and given them a reason to do it with a command that they understand and, and are rewarded for. When do you start using an e-collar? Ideally, never. Letting emotions interfere with giving a dog a correction. Those are both very, very detrimental things to getting a dog to understand what, what the problem is. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to uh, bring you a podcast. I don't have a guest today. It's been a long time since I've done a, a dog Q&A and uh, I wanted to do two things. Number one is, is take questions on YouTube. A few weeks ago, I posted a a question just saying, you know, hey, you know, if, if you have any questions, fire them away. I guess that's not really a question. Um, but I, I wanted to entertain your guys' questions, answer them to the best of my ability, and also show you the new packaging for uh, the Team Dog Dog Food uh, that I have, as well as the treats and supplements. Uh, as you can see, this new bags, you got the Essential uh, in the blue bag and the Elite Blend in the black and gold. The difference between the two, for those that have, have asked and haven't just looked at the uh, ingredients slash uh, nutritional profile, it's 30% protein and 25% fat on the Elite Blend and 26 protein and 20 on the Essential. So uh, if you've got a more active dog, dog that's harder to keep weight on, the Elite Blend is great. If you've got a dog that's just more of a house pet, companion animal, uh, is not hard to keep weight on and, and doesn't burn a ton of calories, then the Essential Blend is probably your huckleberry. Um, there is salmon and herring, uh, blends, and there's also a chicken and sweet potato blend. So, uh, we've also got some new stuff coming out, some new products on the treat line side, which I'm excited about, which, uh, I'm not going to talk about, but just be on the lookout for, as well as a new blend of dog food. That's totally new and, uh, and completely unlike anything that we've uh, been working with the last couple of years. So without further ado, I'm just going to go through all the questions that people uh, fired away on on the YouTube comment section and sift through them and uh, and answer them. So here we go. Uh, this is from Chris. Uh, we have a German Shepherd. We got him when he was six months old. He loves the ladies but is scared shitless when guys are around. It's taken him close to three months now to get him to warm up to me. I'm not sure if there's been any trauma caused by a dude in his past. Uh, is there anything we can try with him so he isn't pissing himself scared when my friends, guys come over to visit it's a very common question uh dogs that are are shy and uh bordering on anxious around uh male or more dominant figures one of the most common i would call it uh most likely a misconception is that there was some trauma associated with males in their past uh, that, that gets pinned on men a lot of times is like oh this you know the dog doesn't like men i'm sure he was beaten by them like that's a big jump um Generally speaking, you know, because dogs are so nonverbal and typically, you know, if a male with a, a bigger stature uh, and more presence, the, the, the higher that is, the more likely it's going to intimidate the dog, scare the dog, or elicit that type of response where maybe the dog has its tail tucked, uh, you know, it, it pees a, l a little bit and, you know, pins its ears back is, is kind of generally frightened. And, and that's not an uncommon thing. Generally what that's from there's two things. Number one is just the genetic nerve of the dog. Uh, dogs with a, that are a little more on the thin nerved side typically uh, showcase that. The other component is that the dog just hasn't been around very many other people. You know, if a dog spends most of its formative months in uh, indoors and you know in a very specific environment, not around a bunch of other people, uh, stimuli that's maybe a little bit environmentally challenging then it's not uncommon to see that. Um, so in that, uh, even if, let's say, for example, uh, hypothetically, that, that there was some sort of male-induced trauma in the past, I would still tackle it the same way, which is you want to build the dog's confidence. Um, 
or try to build the dog's confidence. Now, you're going to be limited by the dog's genetic nerve. Uh, that you can't train in or out, uh, but you can make some adjustments and help uh, try to work the dog through it. The biggest thing to think, think of and keep in mind is keeping things positive and not overwhelming the dog. Um, so if let, let's say, for example, it's a, a male presence and, and there's one in particular, it's a bigger guy, deeper voice, whatever it is. There's one person in particular that you see this behavior exacerbated the most out of, then you want to, uh, have that person present, but tell them to be very mindful about, you know, not making eye contact, not making frontal, um, you know, movements or, or, you know, frontal presentations to the dog, something as simple as, and for those of you listening, uh, I encourage you to go to the YouTube because I'll, I'll kind of showcase it. Just something as simple as me, you know, if I'm looking at the camera like this, you know, let's say the camera is the dog, you know, and my my posture is such and, I, and I'm looking at the dog and I'm kind of walking towards him, talking to him, bending down towards him, you know, which to the dog is, is kind of being smothered versus, you know, maybe my my head's down a little bit. Uh, I'm not looking at him. My, my shoulders are not square. They're turned to, to an angle. Maybe I go sit down on the couch and just completely ignore the dog. Something that simple uh, can go a long way. With that, uh, you want to have people around that are cognizant of and conscious of doing those types of things to try to help the dog. So that's the first part is, is having people help you um, using their body language to help augment the dog being comfortable and not being a little bit overwhelmed or intimidated. The other thing, too, is, you know, you can use prey drive or food drive, um, you know, to help make a positive association with those things. So let's say during those scenarios, you've got a pouch full of food. Uh, that's what you're feeding the dog. And, and I recommend this to everybody, both my online training and really any problem that, that comes about is feeding through training, not just setting a bowl of food down. But um, so doing training sessions where you've got his food in a pouch, you've got a clicker. And as somebody walks through the door, that the instant that dog even notices that that's happening, click and give him some food. Now you're making a positive association with those figures that have historically been intimidating. And now, now you're bridging that gap and, and pairing a positive association, i.e. a primary reinforcer food and that person. You can really do that with anything that the dog finds uh, overwhelming or intimidating or uh, in, in certain instances, even when dogs are aggressive towards things, it's a little more difficult when there's aggression involved because the mental state is a lot higher, but we'll cover that in another question. Um, so with that, uh, those two things can, can go a long way. Uh, also taking the dog out, uh, similarly feeding through training, walking them through Home Depot or a, you know, a park with uh, you know, kids playing and, and loud noise stimulus, etc. Marking and rewarding when the dog is, is handling those things well or even the introduction to those things so that they're making that positive association. But that goes a long way with, with again, with all of those types of things. So um, I have, you know, a lot of videos with my online training at teamdog.pet that, uh, that I go through a lot of these things and I answer questions uh, every Monday as well. But I hope that answers your question, Chris. Uh, we could probably spend a, a full half hour talking about it. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Uh, on to the next. Anthony asks, my eight-year-old bully loves people but hates dogs. Anything I can do to fix that? Yes, of course. Um, similarly, um, you know, you want to make positive associations with the dog paying attention to you no matter what's going on. This is my, um, you know, primary mode of, of control work, frankly, is, uh, you know, people talk a lot about socialization, uh, and I, I have a, a YouTube video specifically to just why you shouldn't socialize your dogs or, or how to do it, et cetera. It's, it's a few years old at this point, but I'll, I'll kind of re-synopsize it. A dog being social does not mean that the dog can, can or should just go run loose with, you know, tons of other dogs, kids, you know, strangers, et cetera. From my perspective, um, you know, a socialized dog is a dog that can tolerate and be around anything and not react to it. 
That's the biggest thing and, and one of the biggest problems I see people have is, you know, they say, your dog's not socialized because it's aggressive towards other animals. And I would say, you know, and unfortunately, you know, you see a lot of people say, well, how we're going to fix it is we're going to, you know, try to get these dogs to get along. Just like with people, you know, some dogs aren't good at getting along with any other dogs. Um, you know, some of it's genetic. Some of it is their exposure and experience being brought up. Some of it is a, a perfect storm combination of both of those things and, and in which those cases they're the most difficult to deal with. But um, knowing that, you know, some people don't play well with others, uh, some dogs don't play well with others. And so in, instead of trying to make your dog get along with other dogs, and, and most people's interpretation of that is they should be running loose at a dog park with, you know, toys around and, and kids and all these different stimulus, uh, stimulus taking place and, and the dog be okay with it, is make the dog uh, be able to be in any of these situations and, and not respond. And so what that starts with is taking a few steps back. Most people would say, okay, dog doesn't like other dogs. Let's get him around other dogs and try to work on that. The problem is, is that that dog's mental state is a 12 out of 10 at that point, and, and you're not going to get his attention. No different than somebody in a street fight. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to get their attention very easily either without either severe correction slash punishment or, you know, picking them up and removing them from the situation. So taking a few steps back, again, feeding through training, remove all of these things, you know, that, that the dog is paying attention to, in this case, other dogs, and feed through training by just getting eye contact. That's the first thing I do with all of my dogs is, I, again, I feed through training, and so they're not getting a, just a bowl of food set down. I take whatever they eat throughout the day, I put it in a Tupperware on top of a crate, and uh, I put, you know, a couple handfuls of food in a pouch, grab the clicker, grab the leash, click it to them. We go out in the backyard, there's not much going on. I don't say anything, I don't ask anything of them. I, you know, I'm very nonchalant and very stoic in my movements. As soon as that dog makes eye contact with me, I mark it and reward it. Think of it like a, a camera taking a picture. That's the, the snapshot, the shutter is the clicker. The, the timing needs to be the instant that that dog's eyes make contact with yours is that you're marking that and then feeding them. And then I turn, turn away from them intentionally and walk away from them. And so over time, uh, you get to where the dog is conditioned to make eye contact and focus on you. From there, I slowly introduce more and more stimuli that are distracting. It could be something at first as simple as, you know, a, a chair, you know, a lawn chair or a, a bucket out in the middle of, of the yard that's just sitting there that wasn't there before that the dog's not used to. The dog is inherently going to notice that, pay attention. And again, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to wait for that dog to decide to ignore that and look back at me. And the instant he does, bam, mark and reward him with food. From there, I'm going to slowly introduce more challenging and more challenging stimuli. And, and it's a very gradual, linear curve uh, so that the dog can get used to being just a little more challenged. The same way uh, weightlifting, as an example, is that you're not going from you know, trying to deadlift the bar to 5,000 pounds. Gradually uh, challenge the dog more and more. Uh, on leash, off leash, backyard, front yard, more, you know, bu busier environments out in town, et cetera, condition the dog to where, um, you know, that, that dog is paying attention to you. Once the dog showcases that he understands looking at you gets him paid and now, now he's just glued to you all the time, that's when you want to pair it with a command. It can be focus, it can be look, watch, uh, you can use his name, heal, what, whatever it is that you want to do, but have a, a specific command so that when you're out in town, when you, when you give that dog that command, he's looking at you. And when you're, even when you're walking, he's focused in an attention healed, looking at you, and you can navigate your way through, through anything. You know, and again, whether it's dogs barking on a fence line, kids with an ice cream cone in Home Depot, whatever the case is, is that that dog is, is locked on you and paying attention no matter what. And so, Anthony, if you go through that process, that's your best uh, mode of action in terms of getting that dog to ignore other dogs and just pay attention to you no matter what. So, um, you know, it kind of reminds me of the Jack Sparrow. The problem isn't the problem. It's, you know, your, uh, your feelings on the problem. Something I'm sure I just butchered that. But it, uh, the point remains the same is, is that most people – try to address, you know, the, the problem when it's actually taking a few steps back. The problem is that the dog won't pay attention to you no matter what's going on. No matter what dog you have and no matter how 
um, you know, ill-tempered they are towards any stimuli, if you use this method and get them to, to pay attention to you and focus on you and you put enough repetitions and conditioning into them, you can get dogs that, uh, you know, historically would chase deer, rabbits, want to get in a fight with another dog, what have you, to where they completely ignore it and will just look at you. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen in three training sessions over a, a week period. Um, but it can can happen. It may take a few months, but that's your best bet uh, to getting the dog to, to pay attention to you. And, and, you know, if he hates other dogs, as you put it, uh, you know, to just ignore them and, and keep locked on you. So hope that uh, does it. <clears throat> How long does it take? This is from uh, Brenda. How long does it take to train um, dogs, you know, from the time that you receive them? Uh, it's a good question, a common question. It depends. Uh, it depends on how old the dog is, the amount of training that they've had. I mean, even the, the personal protection dogs that I get in, you know, when I get them, they're usually adults because they need to be mentally mature to be able to even do some of the testing to make sure that the dog has what it takes to do the type of protection work. But, um, some dogs have more training than others. None of them are complete and just turnkey and, and ready to deliver to a client. I'm, I'm always going to spend at least a few months with them. Uh, sometimes it may be as short as, say, three months. Sometimes it can take, you know, the better part of a year. Uh, the two factors are where is the dog at when I get them, and the end user client, that varies too. Uh, where does that need to be? You know, if it's a suburban environment, where, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, pretty standard, there's no other pets, there's no small kids, they're not traveling constantly with a dog, flying on a jet with it, you know, et cetera. Um, that's going to take a shorter amount of time. Whereas, let's say they've got multiple homes and a private jet that they're flying, you know, constantly on, and they've got, you know, a special needs child or a an in law in a wheelchair that lives with them, or you know, certain extenuating circumstances that are going to require me to put, you know, more time and energy into training sessions that are very specific to what that end user is. That's on the personal protection side, which is frankly most of the training that I do at this point. For police and military, kind of similarly, depends on you know what it is. Do they want a fully trained explosive detection and patrol dog? You know that's going to take a year, year and a half. Um, you know if they just want a green dog with some imprinting done, it may you know again take a few months. So it's going to it's going to vary greatly on you know again where the dog is and where they need to be. Um. Let's see. Keegan uh, asks, is mouthing as bad as trainers say? I roughhouse with my Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and he likes to gently mouth. Um, you're going to hear me say it depends probably uh, at the start of just about every question. What I will say is mouthing isn't bad uh, with one caveat, and that is that it, it's understood for both you and the dog that it's a game, and the instant that you want it to stop, you can use one word and give the dog a command and knock it off. Where there's a problem is when there's a question as to who's who in the relationship. I'd say the same thing about getting, letting a dog up on the couch with you, letting the dog sleep in bed with you. Um, if the dog is not where they need to be um, from a training standpoint, then I don't allow any of those things. I don't allow them to pull. I don't allow them to jump on, on a couch. I don't let, let them get up in bed. I don't let them mouth me. I, I don't let there be any gray area as to who's who. Once all of that is established, uh, then it's okay to do all of those things. Like, you know, when I have dogs that I am building a relationship with, even if I'm turning them over to somebody else, I'll get to a point where I'll let them, you know, sleep in bed or get up on the couch or I'll even, you know, get on the ground and roll around with them and, and play, you know, roughhouse and, and things like that. But the instant that I say, okay, that's enough, go to your bed or place or whatever command I give them that the dog, bam, instantly snaps out of it, stops doing it and respects my authority, then it's okay. So as long as all of those boxes are checked that from a control standpoint, that basically no matter what's going on, you can give the dog a command and it will listen. Um, as long as that is, is a possibility, then, um, then mouthing and any of the other things that some people may view as gray areas or not a good idea uh, are okay. You know, it's, it's not a good idea uh, if, if you can't check that box. All right, David asks, when do you start using an e-collar? Ideally, never. Um, you know, my goal is to, is to use as few tools as possible uh, as it relates to training equipment <clears throat> uh, from a control work standpoint. Um, now, I will say, 
kind of similar to the last question is that several boxes need to be checked. And I talk about this both in my online training at Team Dog Pet as well as when I do my presentation of uh, the True Foundations presentation that I that I teach at different police seminars and things like that. Um, <clears throat> the short answer is I, I want to build a relationship with the dog first, and that's going to be based on a, on a very positive methodology. Um, you know, I'm going to use food. I'm going to use prey drive, I'm going to use interaction and engagement, um, you know, time spent with a dog to build a relationship where through that training, uh, feeding through training, you know, crating to, to uh, get rid of all of the white noise and, and really spend time with the dog, conditioning and shaping the behaviors that I want, I'm going to do that first. Um, and I'm going to spend, you know, weeks to months doing that until I know that I've given the dog um, basically every chance to learn that I can afford him uh, before I even think about using a, a corrective measure. With one caveat, is that is if you've got a dog who's gen genuinely taking a shot at the title, you know, not just blowing you off and not listening to you, that's a, a totally separate issue. If I get a dog in that, that genuinely is, is saying, you know, like, hey, if I've got a resource, any, any food in my hand, any type of reward object, toy ball, et cetera, and the dog is getting aggressive trying to take it from me, then I'm going to do what I have to do as a trainer and from a hierarchy standpoint to demonstrate to the, to the dog that that's unacceptable. So there are instances where I may use an e-collar or a prong collar very, very early in the relationship with the dog, but that's the only case. Um, because even then, it's dicey. You know, If you've got a dog who, who's taking that approach to you, um, you've got to be very, very particular and, and strategic in how you employ those corrective measures or you may end up in a, in a battle with the dog because the dog is obviously strong and dominant. So um, that being said, in terms of using the e-collar, I'm, I'm going to you know, use, use weeks to months of, of really building and conditioning the relationship through you know, feeding, through training, uh, shaping those behaviors, getting to where the dog you know knows what the game is and and what I'm expecting of them before I ever even introduce it. Um, step two is that I'm going to make sure that the dog understands why I'm using it, and that's a big thing that I think a lot of people uh, screw up. Frankly, is that they they you know don't have a good relationship with the dog. The dog's confused as to what's being asked of them, and they put an e-collar or a prong collar on and just start correcting the dog. Shaping the behavior first, which is our, as a human being, our way of speaking dog or communicating to the dog that this is, this is what our expectations are. You know, you and I, all of us as human beings, know what we expect of the dog. The dog has no idea, you know, and, and we have to show them through our actions, and through our actions is giving them something good for doing what, what we ask of them. That's how they understand, oh, this is what you want. Um, and so I'm going to make sure that I do that first. Um, and, and in that second part, I'm going to make sure that the dog understands. And by that, I've seen him demonstrate, you know, through 97% probability that he understands the command that I'm giving him. He knows what it is. He knows what he's supposed to be doing. You know, we've, we've been through this for, you know, months and now he's just deciding to blow me off. So got to make sure that he understands why he's being corrected. The third thing is that I don't have any emotions in terms of skin in the game, all right? Um, one big problem that, that I'll be the first to admit, you know, I've, I've been guilty of in the past is letting emotions um, interfere with giving a dog a correction. And usually, almost always when that's the case, the correction is more than it needs to be, and it goes on for longer than is necessary. You know, and those are both very, very detrimental things to getting a dog to understand what what the problem is. Because let's say, <clears throat> okay, he, he knows why he's being corrected, or let's say the perfect storm of everything. He doesn't know why he's being corrected. You're emotional about it, so you're going overboard and doing it for longer, and you're not stopping when, when the dog ceases what he's doing. You know, those, those three things combined is a surefire way to really, really screw the dog's mind up in terms of, of what his expectations are and, and what he thinks is expected of him and his relationship with you. It's confused, you know, at this point, you know, bordering on scared because you're, you're emotional about it. And when he stops doing what you want him to do, you keep going. You know, that's basically the, the three worst things you can do, especially together. So um, 
if all of those boxes are checked, I've built a relationship with the dog. He trusts me. We've got a good, good, you know, trust based relationship. I've shaped his behavior enough to where I know he knows what I'm asking of him and, and he's just deciding not to do it. I'm not emotional about it. And I'm only doing the level of correction required to cease the behavior. Uh, and it stops immediately when that, that behavior ceases. All of those things need to be present before I use an e-collar. So I would say, uh, you know, generally speaking, the soonest is going to be um, a few months after I've had the dog, provided the dog is an adult. You know, if the dog is, is a puppy from six weeks old, I would say most of the time uh, an e-collar shouldn't be on them, you know, until they're closer to a year old or, or even older. Uh, again, ideally never. Uh, if, if I've taken a dog from six weeks and shaped them how I want and, you know, really controlled the environment to set them up for success, then uh, my goal is to never use one. Uh, but that's how I kind of go through that, that process. Uh, I'm not sure what this username is. I'm curious what you think about cats. Um, I like cats. I uh, did not like them growing up. I was allergic to them, uh, horribly so. Uh, but now I like them. Uh, I like them from a useful capacity standpoint, a, a good Mauser cat, uh, you know, that helps helps keep, keep mice at bay and, and it's just kind of cool to have around. We have uh, a couple of them out at the ranch and they do a great job of, uh, of tidying the place up and they're just kind of cool. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him, and his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bub's Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bub's or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bub's brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day. They give 100% back. So uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee. The MCT oil powder, the same thing. Uh, it mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint from a joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as, as we age, uh, that are integral components to, uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bubs Naturals and, uh, be able to, to work with them and, and sponsor a product that, uh, number one is a high quality product. And number two is, is so near and dear to, uh, you know, to my heart and to the mic drop podcast for, for who it, uh, was started for and what it stands for, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's an amazing, amazing place to be. So, um, it is whole 30 approved. Um, it's, uh, sport certified, so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, right now they're, they're offering, uh, 20%, <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and, uh, use the mic drop code. So, uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out incorporated into your day day to day for joint health for brain health uh, for cognition for gut health and uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things uh, in glenn bubs honor so uh, go to bubsnaturals.com mic drop is the code 20 percent off all right so i want to talk to you real quick about a product i've been using for a long time long time sponsor and supporter of the show mud water uh, got rid of coffee Switch to mud water. Uh, it tastes great. I like to mix my uh, Bub's collagen and, uh, and MCT oil powder with it. Uh, a little bit of vanilla drops, and uh, it's fantastic. Um, it's got a host of different ingredients. There's cacao and chai for a hint of caffeine and kind of a hot chocolate type flavor. There's lion's mane for focus. Cordyceps to promote natural energy and uh, both chaga and raishi to support a healthy immune system. It's Whole30 approved, 100% USDA certified organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher. 
Uh, they do donate monthly to support psychedelic research, and they have since day one. Uh, go get your free frother and free samples of coconut creamer and sweet, sweetener if you go to mudwater, M-U-D-W-T-R dot com forward slash Mike. Uh, on that link, you get all the samples, the frother for free, and that's mudwater, M-U-D-W-T-R dot com slash Mike for that free author, uh, free frother rather. So it's a great product. I've been using it for a long time. Uh, you don't get the upset stomach or the jitters with the tons of caffeine and coffee. Uh, and it's a great vehicle to add uh, whatever other supplements you want to throw into your morning routine. That's mudwater.com slash Mike. Fluffy asks, uh, animal canine chiropractic benefits of the treatment to the handler and fur missile while on active duty and or as a civilian. Uh, I recommend both to both animal, animal and, and handler. Um, the one caveat with that is uh, it's got to be somebody that knows what they're doing. I mean, just like with human beings, like, you know, going to use your best judgment in terms of the person's experience, their qualifications, how long they've been doing it, who they've worked with. Um, but I have seen, um, you know, some pretty significant improvements of, you know, dogs that had certain physical issues that uh, canine chiropractic treatments have, uh, have been a, a, an enormous success, as well as a acupuncture, believe it or not. The asterisk that I'm going to throw in there is if you've got a dog that's uh, – in that doesn't play well with others category. Um, you want to be there and, and be real careful. Uh, you, you may need to muzzle the dog, be there. And again, try to make those positive associations, um, you know, by, by getting a dog used to it. Um, the same way you would, you know, any of the other things that we've talked about, just, uh, you know, pairing, pairing positive associations. If you've got a dog that needs it really bad, but is very, very, uh, aversive to, to being in that environment, you may have the, the chiropractor come try to do it at, at your house. Um, you may exercise the dog lightly first or, or try to mentally engage them and, and satiate their mind, you know, get their yah yas out, so to speak, mentally and physically to the best of your ability before you go do that. I recommend the same thing with nail trimming or grooming or anything that a dog is a little uncomfortable with, bathing, et cetera. Um, but, you know, just kind of the standard way that you want to, uh, you know, associate positively things that a dog is maybe a little unsure of. Uh, user 867 asks, what is canine reactivity? How is this different or is it the same as aggression? Uh, that's a great question. To me, canine reactivity is, is really any time a dog showcases uh, a significant change in behavior um, going from normal, neutral, calm to the exact opposite of that. Um, how is it the difference, or, or is it different, or is it the same as aggression? It depends. Um, what I will say is that you know usually it, it's 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 a reactivity uh, or or it's a reactive aggression uh, behavior. Not always though. Uh, you know reactivity could be purely in pay, in prey drive, and a lot of people would argue that you know prey drive and aggression are the same things. I disagree. Um, I think they're related and they're similar, but I think there's a difference. Um, you know, and, and so. How, how it uh, boils down to the end user, I think, is kind of semantics. And so I, I would just say that, you know, generally speaking, when a dog is, is in a relatively neutral behavior uh, pattern and now goes from, say, a, a level three or four to a 10 immediately because of a certain stimuli that surprises them, um, you know, that, that's how I would define reactivity, um, you know. It doesn't ask how you deal with it or whatever, but I would say, you know, similar to the last couple of questions that I answered uh, of whatever that stimuli is that's causing your dog to be reactive, try to, to bring it down a few notches and, and have the introduction to whatever that stimuli is be further away or less intrusive or less surprising and feed them through training or playing, you know, tug, tug with them, et cetera, while it's going on to try to disassociate, dis, uh, desensitize them is, is a good way to, to deal with it. Uh, here's a gun question I'm not going to answer on this one. Uh, I have two dogs, a six-year-old Doberman Belgian Mal mix uh, who has no problems, who has no problems and is very well behaved and trained, stays out of the kennel all day. And I have a nine-month-old Doberman. Is it acceptable for the days that I don't have the patience to work on training and don't want her to sit in the kennel that I set up puzzles and games for her throughout the backyard in the house so she's not sitting in the kennel and using her brain in a positive way. The puzzles I set up for her are usually bottles or something I can put food in and she has to figure out how to get it out. 
She'll normally stay focused on that task until she has retrieved all of the food. Uh, two things with this. Um, I, I, would, I, I don't ever recommend leaving your dog unattended, whether it's a puzzle uh, or not, when, when you're still in that training phase. And even when you're not in the training phase, uh, let's say your dog is everything you want it to be and you kick them out in the backyard and you go to work for eight hours. There are a lot of things that can go wrong in that environment that you have no control over, that the dog has no control over. It can be another animal. It can be a, a service worker, gas lines, et cetera. I mean, there, there's too many things uh, that can go wrong. That's number one. Number two is that mental satiation part. While I appreciate your desire to want to do that, you know, the days that you don't feel like training them, train them anyway. Uh, just like with working out, you know, the days you don't want to work out, that's when you should especially work out. Um, you know, to me, that that's really the core component to having a dog is that you got to do it anyway, you know, especially when they're in that training phase, like you, you just got to push through and do it. Um, I, I don't ever like to outsource mental tasks and engagement to an inanimate object, i.e. the backyard, because I want you to put in the puzzles in the backyard. I want you to put yourself in, in your dog's shoes for a minute. Because if, if you want the dog to listen to you, right, then the percentage of time that, that engagement is taking place where the dog is using its mind and figuring things out, it needs to be overwhelmingly with you. Right, not the backyard, not inanimate objects. You know, it, it's akin to putting an iPad in a child's lap uh, or on the dinner table so that you don't have to parent them. It, it's no good. Period. Um, again, I, I can appreciate the thought process behind it, but you have to look at it from that standpoint: is that you need to be the one that's that's engaging and interacting with your dog overwhelmingly when they're going through this this period, so that they're making that association with you. I would rather you crate the dog and when you get home and don't feel like doing it saying, I owe it to the dog. It's my responsibility. He's been in his, in his crate. I don't feel like it. I'm going to do it anyway. So to me, if you're having a lot of those days, then I would reevaluate even having a dog um, because that, that's just part of the deal. All right. Uh, what is classical versus operant conditioning? Which one is more effective in training? Um, so there, there's a lot of um, kind of buzzwords and explanations and analogies used with, with both of them. Uh, the most pun intended classic example of classical conditioning is Pavlov, who you know coined the term, which is ringing a bell, feeding a dog. Over time, just the ringing of the bell solicits a uh, a response from the dogs, you know, in terms of salivating because they they make the association of of the bell equals food. Um, operant conditioning is more, um, I'm not even going to say complicated. It's just more thorough. It's more well-rounded in terms of the explanation. But the, the best way that I like to um, describe it is there's four quadrants, you know, and, and really um, I think it's, you know, kind of semantics of saying, well, are you using operant conditioning or not? From my standpoint, everybody uses operant, one of the four quadrants of operant conditioning every time you interact with and train a dog. Which one you're in, uh, you know, it's going to depend on what you're doing. But the, the way to look at it is you've got positive and negative reinforcement and you've got positive and negative punishment. Now, most people look at positive and negative as good or bad, and that's a mistake. Uh, in this context, Positive and negative is is merely adding or subtracting. Okay, it's not good and bad. So a lot of people say, "Oh, you're using a lot of a lot of negative reinforcement." Well, that, that means you're removing reinforcement. That doesn't mean that you're punishing the dog. Punishing a dog is positive punishment. Removing punishment uh, from a dog is negative punishment. An example would be, you you turn on you know the stimulus or, or the punishment factor from a, from a remote collar and then give the dog a command to go in his crate. And when he does, then you take it away. You, you release it be an example of negative punishment. Um, so where, where I see people, uh, kind of step on their own toes with this is, is being overly concerned of what quadrant they're technically in. Um, and to me, you know, this is something that's always kind of puzzled me with a lot of dog trainers is how much time they'll spend arguing about whether or not something is technically positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement or, you know, positive punishment or negative punishment. 
to me, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, the, the way I always look at it and try to always remember it and recommend to people is that using B.F. Skinner, who is the, the godfather of operant conditioning, um, you know, is basically, you know, his, his most poignant statement, I think, with all of it is anything that is reinforced is likely to occur again. I'm going to say that one more time. Anything that is reinforced is likely to occur again. If it's something that you want, right, and it happens, mark it and reinforce it. If it's something that you don't want, either withhold reinforcement and extinguish that behavior, i.e. they're not getting rewarded for it, whether it's attention, food, whatever, or you're adding punishment to extinguish a undesirable behavior, i.e. getting into the trash, etc. It's really that simple. Like, which of those four quadrants a certain behavior or tactic falls into, I, I think, in the grand scheme of things, doesn't matter. To me, it's, you know, I, I like to talk about the A plus B equals C formula uh, in that same vein, what, whatever you want to call it. You know, if, if C, I want, I want everybody to, to think about A plus B equals C. It's very simple. If C, right, is something that you want, desirable behavior, Make A plus B equals C until it becomes a conditioned response. If C is something you don't want, then make A plus B not equal C enough times to where the dog stops anticipating it. That's really it. Um, you know, to me, that's kind of the master formula of dog training for just about everything. I mean, if you think about all of the things that you want your dog to do and all of the things that you don't want them to do, those are in those C categories. And you're either going to set the environment up and get the dog to make that decision very easily, and you're going to mark it and reward it, i.e. reinforce it to make A plus B equals C all the time, or see something that really drives you nuts, and you're going to break that association of A plus B equals that. An example would be you know, a dog that loses their mind when you put a leash on them. right? So C is that the dog is, is spinning around, flipping around, being a total pain in the ass when you try to put a leash on them to take them for a walk. Well, A is grabbing the leash plus B, connecting it to the dog's neck, equals C, we're going for a walk. So when A plus B equals C enough times, the presence of A, right, just grabbing the leash for the dog equals the anticipation of C, why he's losing his mind. Because in every single instance that you've grabbed that leash and connected it to the dog's neck, you've taken him for a walk. So that formula is a perfect and correct formula in the dog's mind. So you need to now make that formula not make sense to them. So now I'm going to grab the leash. I may connect it to the dog's neck. Then I disconnect it and wrap it around my waist and go sit down. And now the dog looks around and, and is thinking, what the hell just happened? Right. And so keeping all of that in mind, um, the, the C portion is very, it's very simple. It's either something you want and you make that formula work or C is something you don't want and you disassociate it and, and break that formula in the dog's mind. All right, uh, Busby61 says, I have a 15-week-old Cavapoo. Looks like a miniature Brittany. Do you have a video on house training? If not, how do you house train a dog? It craps one, if it craps one more time on the floor, I might have to old yeller. Uh, just kidding, it says. I'm not sure you are kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, house training is pretty simple. Um, and this, you know, whether it's house training in terms of the dog not going to the bathroom uh, in your house, to me, house training is kind of all encompassing. It's obviously that, but it's not getting into things it's not supposed to. It's not chewing up things. It's not getting on furniture it doesn't belong on, et cetera. It's, it's all kind of related. And so crate training, you know, the dog's 15 weeks, uh, still pretty young, but using a crate and feeding through training, you know, so the dog is always in the crate other than when I get them out and train with them. So early on when the dog is young, dogs in the crate, you got to get them out, you know, every couple hours for a training session. It's a lot of work. Um, that is the surefire way to accomplish all of the different behavioral tasks that you're looking to accomplish with the dog. By not doing that, you're confusing the dog, right? Because if a dog is in a crate, all of the white noise that is the environment inside your house is removed from the equation. So now the dog is in a neutral environment. When you get that dog out, you clip a leash to it, you've got your food in your pouch, you've got your clicker, and now I take the dog out. The dog's on a leash inside my house, right? Uh, people are like, 
You have a leash on, on the dog inside the house? Yes, inside the house is no different than outside the house when a dog is young and is untrained and doesn't listen. It's all stimuli that the dog is going to get into and, and mess with that I don't want them to. And so I'm going to use a dog bed, I'm going to use eye contact, and I'm going to use the leash to control the dog's behavior and, and make it hard for them to make mistakes, make it easy for them to make the right decision, and then it gets marked and rewarded. Then you're conditioning the behaviors that you want uh, where the dog can't take two steps back every time you take one step forward. And that's really the key. So, you know, just by having that dog and, and um, you know, one of my more popular videos on the teamdog.pet training is, uh, is the structure video where I, you know, spend about a half hour talking about, you know, what, what I'm answering this question as. Uh, but it's really key, you know, using the crate feeding through training, removing that white noise, using a dog bed, something as simple as having, you know, a dog bed in, in a central area or have several of them, have one by, by your dinner table, you know, where, where you want the dog to be when you're eating, where you want the dog to be when you're sleeping, where you want the dog to be when you're watching TV or working at a desk, is that you're using that dog bed as kind of a, a home base or a territory or, you know, it's plot of land that that's, that's the, uh, the boundary, that's the, the border that that dog has to stay stay in. Um, and you're taking them out often, right? So a combination of, you know, crating, having a very structured interior routine, taking the dog out often when they go to the bathroom outside, it gets marked and rewarded the same way sitting does or laying on a dog bed and being supervised that whole time. That's really the only way you can do it. If you expect the dog to, to just roam around the house loose at 15 weeks and not go to the bathroom, you're going to be let down pretty much every time. So stick to that and also uh, check out the video on Team Dog. I have a two and a half. This is from uh, Sal, Sal Matones. Sal Motones. I have a two and a half year old German Shepherd. Um, <clears throat> this one is tall. They uh, they are pets with a fenced in yard. I'm not sure what that means. He runs hard, but seems to be prone to front leg injury at the ankle. Is there a compression sleeve or anything else you can recommend? He has also torn both carpal pads at the base. Different instances have had to be stitched. Any words of wisdom? Try not to beat me up too bad. I try like an MF to be as good with him as I was with my children. I appreciate your dedication. Um, so if he's two and a half, uh, he's tall. Um, he runs hard but seems to be uh, prone to front leg injury. More so than a compression sleeve or anything else that I could recommend, it's really more of a behavioral thing is that if you know, if, if the conditioning of his front legs and pads after, you know, two and a half years are such that he's still getting injured all the time, then there needs to be a kind of a redirection of, of energy and, and behavior that way. And so, um, you know, I, I would limit his ability to, to continue to injure himself. Um, I would also ask what you're feeding him, uh, what his, his body weight composition is like, keeping him as, as lean as you can where – um, you know, his hips are, are easy to feel. They're not, you know, woefully visible, but there's a tuck in his stomach, faint, faint outline of the ribs. Uh, hips are really easy to touch, you know, a nice lean trim dog. That's going to help. You know, if your dog is barrel fat and, and is carrying an extra 30 pounds, uh, you know, that, that's going to be harder on everything for him. So, um, and also if he's, you know, eating, um, you know, poor nutrition that's nutritionally deficient, unlike this team dog food right here that's sitting on the couch next to me as my guest, um, you know, then then th those things are going to play a role. But uh, the biggest thing is is just not allowing him to, to tear ass and run super hard up and down a fence line if it continues to injure him. Uh, I mean, that those are the three things that without being there and seeing him and, and really kind of doing an evaluation uh, that come to mind. So I would uh, give give those all a shot. User 867 and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, what does it mean to socialize a dog? Uh, I already went over that, but I, and it says, what's the optimal time in a dog's life to be socialized? I will address that. Um, so the short answer is immediately, uh, basically right when you get the dog, other than, you know, give him at least a few days to settle in and, and uh, get his bearings and, and seem like he's at least comfortable, like, got to be comfortable with you and, and get in a good routine there. It may take a few days, may, may take a few weeks. Some instances it may take a couple of months, but, uh, but that socialized thing, again, I, I want to reiterate that socialization to most people, unfortunately means taking them to a dog park or an area where they're going to be around a lot of people and dogs and, and having them interact 
and have them behave in these interactions how you think uh, they should, i.e. calm and not doing anything even if other dogs are acting a fool or kids are you know, being overly aggressive with personal space, etc. I don't like to have my dogs interact with people that they don't need to interact with. That's kids, adults, pe- uh, you know, other people's pets, livestock, whatever. Uh, I want them to be able to be around all of those things, uh, even right next to them and completely ignore them. Right to me, that's the key to a dog being socialized: is they can tolerate anything, um, but they're not interacting with it, uh, and that's because I'm, you know, asking them not to. And so, like I've said multiple times already, is that you know by feeding through training and using that focus component, uh, get the dog to to pay attention to you no matter what's going on, and, and that can start essentially right away. Word of the Wise podcast asks, a family member of mine has a German Shepherd that's very aggressive and has bitten two people already. What can be done to fix this, and can they be trusted after biting someone again? Unfortunately, it's too vague of a question for me to to be able to answer super definitively, uh, other than that I will say, you know, just, again, the, the socialization of a dog, you know, training your dog to pay attention to you no matter what's going on. You guys are probably seeing a recurring theme here. That, that fixes 98% of the problems that people either don't like about their dogs or that their dogs get them into trouble over. I want you to think about all of the negative things that, that we associate or, or maybe have in terms of dealing with our own dogs. What's the overwhelming majority of them? If, and I want you to think that if, if you have the ability to give your dog a command and they will heal next to you and look up at you and, and heal with you no matter what is going on, right? Pick anything, traffic, people playing soccer, kids running by with a hot dog hanging out of their pocket, whatever. Um, that that dog will ignore all of that and look at you and, and just heal right through hell's gates. How, how many of you would have problems with your dogs if, if you could do that no matter what, inside the house, outside the house, out in town, whatever? Very few, right? That, that fixes so many problems that people have with their dogs is just getting them to pay attention and no matter what's going on. And so in this case, similarly, I would say, again, without saying the dog, I don't, I don't know what the circumstances were uh, as to why people were bitten. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times dog, dog bites occur and it's not really the dog's, I mean, it's completely not the dog's fault if you look at it from the 30,000 foot view of we, we always put our dogs in whatever position they're in. So ultimately it's always our fault. Right. But, um, but I don't know what the circumstances were, you know, that, that led to him biting somebody, but either way, whether they're warranted or unwarranted, fair, unfair, it doesn't matter. The fact is, is that if that German shepherd of, of the family member of yours has the ability to be given one command and lock on to them and, and heal and, and pay attention and nothing else going on, That's how you're going to avoid that problem in terms of whether or not they can be trusted or not. That's how you, you build trust, right? Is is, is if I train my dog and condition them to do that, to look at me, no matter what's going on, I'm going to trust that I can do a lot of things with that dog and nobody's going to get bit accidentally. That's how I would approach it. In today's crazy world with natural disasters, travel, pandemics, supply chain shortages, you name it. Jace Medical comes through with antibiotics uh, that you can just fill out a simple form and get online. They've recently added ivermectin to their list of uh, appropriate and available medications. Uh, and I will say, you know, I've, I've used this in a number of occasions, whether it's for uh, myself, family, uh, you can even use them on your pets. Um, make sure that you get the dosages correct. But, uh, you know, being able to, to order medications, antibiotics, ivermectin, et cetera, uh, is pretty key and, and extremely important. Um, you, you never want to get caught unprepared. Uh, everybody should be empowered enough to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. And Jace handles everything from online evaluations to licensed pharmacy, medication delivery, and ongoing consultation and care. Um, I can't recommend these guys enough for all your antibiotic and uh, emergency supply needs as it relates to those types of medications go to jacemedical.com and enter code drop at checkout for discount on your order that's promo code drop at j-a-s-e medical.com 
All right, as you guys know, I used to dip when I was in the military, uh, as a lot of us do. Um, the tradition of it and just the ritual, uh, which the enjoyment that comes from that is significant and not one that I uh, particularly like to give up, uh, as I know a lot of my brothers in arms uh, tend to feel the same way, which is why I like Black Buffalo. It's got two product types, which are uh, long cut and pouches. They're made from the same base ingredients, which is edible green leaves, food grade ingredients, and no tobacco leaf or stem. In both of those formats, you can get wintergreen, mint, straight peach, or blood orange. Um, and it's just a, it's a phenomenal product that, uh, you know, is tobacco free. Uh, they also have nicotine, uh, pharmaceutical grade nicotine versions and nicotine free versions. If you want to ditch the nicotine as well. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I've, I've enjoyed and, and been able to transition off of dip from, uh, and it's something that, um, in terms of honoring that ritual and, and getting that same feeling, uh, of having that ritualistic dip is, uh, is pretty awesome. So Go to blackbuffalo.com uh, for your introductory package and uh, get 20% off with code Mike Drop. That's blackbuffalo.com, 20% off, code Mike Drop. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Black Buffalo products are intended for adults age 21 and older who are consumers of nicotine or tobacco. All right, uh, Chebby Chev says, my five-year-old neuter male boxer is very friendly but gets super angry and aggressive towards four certain people and two dogs in the neighborhood to the point that I can't redirect his attention and have to wrestle him away. One of them is an eight-year-old girl who comes over to play with my kids. These people have never been mean to him in any way. How can I train him to treat these people the same as he does everyone else? I hate to be a broken record here, um, but exactly like just about every other answer, um, you know, you've got to, to condition them to pay attention to you. You know, the fact that it's just these four certain people and two dogs, obviously something about those people and dogs is triggering for him. However, that just means that the conditioning needs to be at an even higher level for him uh, and, and being around these, these people or dogs. When it comes to people coming over to your house, I like to use a dog bed. <clears throat> When it comes to being out in town, again, on a leash, condition the dog to pay attention to you. In a situation like this where, let's say, maybe you have to walk the dog um, because of your living environment, you have to you know, walk them in, into these environments where they're around these people or dogs, and, and you, know, you, you can't take your time linearly building and conditioning them to, to pay attention to you around them. In that case, I would use a prong collar. Uh, I, I would still contrast it with using food uh, and and try to you know you use the prong collar and, and correct them until they stop you know trying to lunge at or pull drag towards these people or, or other pets um, you know try to, to get as much of a buffer between them as you as you can so that it's lessened so that you know the dog is around them but not right next to them again trying to be as linear as possible and, and as gradual as you can use the prong collar to correct the dog when the dog stops pulling, try to mark and reward. Now, some dogs, you know, after they've been corrected or when they're in that state of mind of, of kind of being bordering on aggressive towards other things, they won't won't accept food or treats, and that's okay. At least try it. At a minimum, you've got to <coughs> uh, communicate to the dog that it's unacceptable. As a, as a five-year-old dog, uh, and I'm assuming you've had him for most of that time, at, at this point, like, I would say you're okay with having to correct the dog if, if it's in that situation where you know he's just not absolutely listening under any circumstance. Then then I would do that. But, um, but I would also spend a lot of time kind of hitting the reset button. You know, crating him. You know, kind of starting over. You know, the same way I do with all of my structure videos on the team dog stuff. Is that you know crate him when you're not there, when you're not interacting with him, or if you're not you know you don't have him on a on a dog bed on a long down stay, or you know doing something with him in your house where he's under command, then I would have him in his crate, get him out, feed him through training. Even though he's five, hit that reset button, go through that process with him for a few weeks to you know to two months at the most, and really work on that that focus piece. Um, and I think that'll help you a lot. My dog barks. At any little noise during the night, how do you remedy this? Um, I'd say put put uh, yourself in a soundproof room. 
No. All right, so it's going to be a little bit dependent on what the, the noises are. Um, the first thing I would do is, if, if you haven't already, is have like a white, white noise machine. Uh, you can use your phone like you can use an app. Um, you know, and have, have something playing that's going to drown some of that out. That That's helpful if you've got a dog that's super, super sensitive to every little thing, then I would have something. It can even be like a, a house fan or a desk fan that makes, you know, some noise. Something that's breaking up that, uh, you know, every little creak or, or whatever. <clears throat> um, the other thing is, you know, during the day is, you know, rewarding the dog for being quiet if, if he's kind of a yapper to begin with. Um, teaching the dog to bark and then to not bark uh, goes a long way also. By that, you know, use a, a stimuli, food, treats, uh, a, a toy, build frustration, get them to bark, pair it with a command, teach them, hey, when I say speak or bark or whatever, <clears throat> that you do that. And then you teach them to, to be quiet in the reverse order. So same thing as you get them to bark without telling them to. You frustrate them with that by just standing there and withholding the reward. They start barking, 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 barking. As soon as they stop barking, I mark it and give them what they want. After you know a few training sessions of that, then I pair it with quiet or whatever it is that you want to use um, to, to tell them to be quiet. And then now go back and forth. Tell them to bark. They bark, reward it. Tell them, you know, tell them to bark. They start barking. You tell them to stop. They stop. You reward it. Teaching a dog to bark and to and to be quiet is important. Most people, um, you know, may teach their dog to bark, but they don't teach them to to stop barking. One of the most common things you see people do, um, even if they haven't taught the dog to bark, is they tell them to shut up. <clears throat> you know, and they'll yell it at them. A dog doesn't know what shut up means. You and I know what shut up means, um, but if, again, if you put yourself in the dog, you haven't taught them to, to cease barking and given them a reason to do it with a command that they understand and, and are rewarded for. When a dog's barking and you go, shut up, what does that sound like? It sounds like barking. So your dog is far more likely to assume that you're barking with him when you yell at a dog to shut up than to actually shut up because he has no idea what it means. So some white noise to drown it out teaching him to bark and then also to be quiet, reinforcing being quiet, um, you know, during the day so that he, he has a thought process of, wow, when I don't bark, uh, I get rewarded for it. Last but not least, if you've done all of those things and he's still just losing his mind at every little thing, then I would probably use a, an actual bark collar on him. Uh, the YS600 from Dogtra uh, is, is a good, good piece of gear for that uh, so that every time he barks, it, it gives him a correction for it. But again, just like with my e-collar recommendations, I would try all of those other things first. <clears throat> um, I don't necessarily want a dog to not bark at all at night. You know, if somebody's kicking the door in, I would love for him to let me know that that's happening if, if I don't know that. So uh, go through that process first before you just completely correct him for it. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. I've gotten a couple of questions uh, regarding certain videos of police handlers treating a dog a certain way or, you know, other kind of things, you know, for me, um, I don't want to use this, this session to, to talk about, um, you know, stuff like that, um, or, or anything that's kind of in the news as it relates to dogs, because there's a lot of sides to it that, uh, you know, I just don't think it's warranted from a training standpoint. I think you can look at a lot of videos and you can tell pretty quickly, like shouldn't be doing that or yeah, it's justified. Maybe there's some gray area, and I'm not talking about this one in particular. I'm just saying, generally speaking, um, you know, my thoughts are on it. Um, you know, are, are going to probably mirror most people's when when they see something. Uh, what's your thoughts on Wilhelm Sowers? What's your thoughts on paralyzed dogs and allowing them to live with wheels devices? Um, what's your thoughts on PETA and its killing of puppies? Well, I'm not a, not a fan of PETA and. They do uh, euthanize more more animals than I think any other organization on the planet. So that's about all I have to say about that, as Forrest Gump would say. Uh, my thoughts on paralyzed dogs and allowing them to live with wheels, I think it's awesome. Um, to me, it's it's there's a lot of tearjerker moments that I see on social media where I see, you know, whether it's, you know, high-level police dogs that their back ends give out and they're in a, in a wheelchair getting a bite, you know, and, and still do stuff. I mean, just like with people, uh, I think there's, there are so many parallels between people and dogs. 
and this is no exception. You know, most people, if, if they're paralyzed, you know, they still want to live, you know, and I think, you know, as long as a dog doesn't outwardly give the impression that every second of his life is being lived in pure agony and absolute misery, I'm all for it. You know, where it can get dicey or gray area wise is when, you know, that dog is, is visually miserable, you know, where you can tell that, that they just are not enjoying themselves. They're not happy. They're miserable. Then that's when you have to, you know, start to talk about the conversation of potentially, uh, you know, humanely euthanizing a dog. That's, but I will say that's, that's for everybody to answer on their own. One of the more common questions I get is when is the right time to put your dog down? Um, and to me, it's, it's up to you. <clears throat> that's not me trying to, you know, cover my own ass and, and get out of answering the question. But to me, it's like, that, that's going to be different for everybody, depending on where they're at in life, what other commitments they have, um, you know, what they see in their relationship with the dog. Um, and, and I think most importantly is that what they're getting from the dog, um, vibe wise is that, you know, I, I've had to put down a number of dogs over the years. One of the toughest things about, um, you know, found, founding the Warrior Dog Foundation is that, you know, we end up having to make those end of life decisions for, you know, hundreds of dogs. Uh, and it's difficult, you know, and it, you always kind of second guess and ask yourself, you know, is it the right time or, or afterwards, did I do it too early? Was it the right time to me? Your, you know, your gut is a pretty valuable tool. Your, your gut's generally going to tell you when you think it's the right time. But I also think dogs are uh, inherently uh, innate in, in their ability to tell us when that time is, you know, and, and, I've always gotten that feeling in, in every instance where I've had to make that decision that, hey, it's time. Um, you know, I've always felt like the dog kind of looked at me like, hey, I'm done. And, you know, that, that's a tough, tough thing to, to witness and, and, to, and to have to grasp and, and take the responsibility to, <clears throat> to do something about. Um, it's the, the worst part and hardest thing about owning a dog, period. Um, you know, but, uh, but that's, that's my take on it is that you got to use your gut and kind of let them tell you when it is. I know you didn't ask that with the, with the paralyzed dogs. I'm assuming that that's kind of a, uh, a, a back end part of, of, of the question of what I think. But, um, again, any type of wheelchair or, or assistive assisting device for a dog, I'm all for it. As long as the dog, you know, isn't just completely miserable. <clears throat> my dog was recently attacked by two dogs and was held by his neck for upwards of 10 to 15 minutes while I was away on CTC rotations, not acted weird towards people, but hasn't had contact with any other dogs. He is not neutered and never has been a fan of other males that are also intact. What should I expect from him going forward with contact with other males, and how can I socialize him so he will not be traumatized by this for the remainder of the time I have with him? He's two and a half. Um. It's the exact same answer is that, you know, what, what to expect, it's impossible to know. You know, I can, I can guess or assume uh, that's, that's irrelevant, frankly. I wouldn't even worry about it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't overthink uh, or even waste your time thinking about how, how might he act. Instead, change the conversation in terms of, you know, his, his ability to focus on you no matter what's going on. I would, I would put all of your time and energy into that into feeding through training and getting him to really focus on you no matter what. And then that way, anytime you're around other dogs, male, female, intact or not, is that he's ignoring them and just paying attention to you and going about his day and having a good time. Uh, that, that's how I would handle it. <clears throat> um, I, have an, I, I have a high-energy American hunting lab. I currently fear, feed him Purina Pro Plan. Well, that's your first problem. You know, he's not on team dog food. Lately, he's been eating a lot of grass, especially after high-intensity training sessions. Could this be a food issue? Are there any good brands you recommend high in, protein, high in protein to help aid his active lifestyle? I don't think you could have asked a better guy for that. As you can see sitting on the couch, split screen, that's the food I would feed. I would feed him the Elite, the gold, Golden Black Bag, uh, plain and simple. Now, to the grass eating, uh, there's a, a multitude of theories as to why dogs do it. Um, and you know, there's so many factors that may determine, uh, or, uh, attract them to do things like that, that it's impossible to say, um, you know, sometimes it's a behavioral thing. Sometimes it's a nutritional thing. Sometimes it's, 
out of boredom. Sometimes it's a, a nervous tick where they're there. It's almost like a, a slight avoidance thing. So without observing the dog and, and really getting into the nitty gritty of, of, you know, why he's doing what he's doing, um, it's impossible to say, but what I would say is I would stop feeding him Purina right, right out of the gate. And that's, even if you don't feed team dog, I would stop feeding him that and feed him something with a better ingredient list than that. What are common signs of a fearful or anxious dog? If any, which of these behaviors are often misinterpreted? Um, common signs of a fearful, anxious dog I means it's, it's overwhelmingly body language. Um, just, you know, like with a person, you can tell if they're scared. Um, you know, the, to me, the most textbook signs are looking at their ears, looking at their tail, looking at their overall posture. So if they're slinking around, their ears are back, their tail's tucked. You know, those are all pretty textbook signs. Now, <clears throat> when they can be interpreted is sometimes when a dog is, is in a position where they feel from a fight or flight standpoint that they're, they're being forced to be confronted or, or to confront something, you know, whether it's behind a, a barrier or, you know, it's in, in a small room, i.e. a vet office, um, you know, where a dog may start out with that. And I, I wouldn't even say it's necessarily misinterpreted, um, you know, but it's, it, it's the, the precursor to a dog being reactive, aggressive or defensively aggressive and, and then ending up attacking somebody right after they displayed that. What I would say is, you know, when you see that behavior out of a dog, what I would not do is, you know, invade their personal space or do anything to exacerbate that, you know, um, because that's if a dog is going to bite out of fear, aggression or reactive, reactive aggression, then that's generally when it's going to happen. Um, in terms of, again, the misinterpretation, um, from my perspective, you know, they're generally not, you know, other than maybe somebody say, Oh, your dog's shy. But again, that that's more, you know, somebody that just has no idea what they're, what they're looking at. I mean, if I had to pinpoint one thing that would probably be the most common is that somebody just thinks the dog is a little shy when the dog is legitimately fearful or anxious, but uh, that's about it. How much training do you do with new owners of your protection dogs? I assume there's some level required for them to effectively handle them as more than a pet. Yes. Um, so throughout the training process, you know, the initial conversation we go over a lot. Um, during the process, you know, some clients I may go over a fair bit with them, some very little. Uh, just depends on on what the environment is, what the expectations are, what, what level the dog is at, et cetera. Um, but then when, when the dog is delivered, then it's several days. It's basically an integration of the dog into that new environment. And, uh, it's my job to be the bridge. You know, I'm really the only constant between the dog and the new environment. So, um, I'm going to do a lot of stuff with the dog. I'm going to do all of the things that they would do or are going to be doing with the dog, uh, while they're, they're around, but I'm doing it with them and then slowly kind of uh, both demonstrate, you know, all of the different ways to handle the dog tips and tricks, et cetera, all the commands, all the behaviors that they know, all the training that they've been through, uh, explain all of that showcase, uh, most of it, and then, um, slowly start to kind of hand leash over to them and, and have them do it while I watch so that I can uh, say, Hey, try doing this. Hey, maybe don't do that. Uh, you know, you're screwing this up or, you know, what, what have you. It's, it's a, it's a process. And it, you know, like I said, it's usually three or four days of, kind of all day intensive training and, and that, but, uh, let's see if a dog has anxiety from certain noises, i.e. rain fireworks and new faces, how do you fix that? Um, again, I, I you know, two, twofold, um, get them to focus on you no matter what's going on so that they ignore that stuff and introduce them to that in a throttled back environment where like, if you know, your dog has anxiety with fireworks, um, or, or let's say rain you using, I mean, especially nowadays with technology, like on Spotify or Amazon music, or just on YouTube, like you can find videos, uh, or, you know, st streaming, um, services that, that, you know, like the spookless CDs, uh, that I recommend or, or used to use for, for puppies that used to be a CD. Now you can just go on Spotify, Amazon music, and you can, and you can play them and, it, and it's fireworks, uh, car horns, thunder, machine gun fire. I mean, you name it. Like there's hours of just crazy noises that, uh, you know, that people would use to desensitize uh, horses as, as young 
or during, you know, during their early training process, we did the same thing with, with working puppies. Um, but the, the key is, is, you know, have that noise around, but have it be quiet enough to where the dog can hear it, but they're not overwhelmed by it. So you're, you're going to adjust the volume to where that's the case. So if you've got to have it on so quiet that they can barely hear it at first, fine. But you want to, uh, again, supplement or make that, that connective association with something positive. You're feeding them, you're playing tug with them, you're playing ball with them, you're you know walking them in an area that they enjoy walking in while that stuff is going on. And then over time, you're going to raise that volume up to where it gets louder and louder and louder during those simple association uh, exercises. <clears throat> The other thing that I would do in conjunction with that, again, feed through training and really get the dog to focus on you so that even if they come into contact with that, they block it out and they're just looking at you like, hey, what's up? I have a two and a half year old pit bull rescue. I've had him a year and change. He's sweet, great personality, kind with children, people, animals, etc. But he gets growly in public places on leash whenever uh, people or animals are walking to the point where it looks like he's vicious. It's embarrassing and can be scary for the people involved. Um, when they get the courage to walk up to him, they realize that it's just excitement being vocalized. What's the remedy for this? Exposure training from a distance seems to work to a point, but I can't get him completely over it. <clears throat> Thanks for your reply, and I'll go choke myself. Well, I appreciate the choking of oneself. Um, so w with this, this is a, a unique question in that it's not actual aggression. It's just, you know, the dog is super excited, and I've seen that out of out of those dogs before where they make some some crazy noises that you'd think – are representative of either forward aggression or reactive aggression, et cetera, but it, it's just excitement. Um, so with that, um, just like any other behavior, though, I would condition it out of them by using food in the absence of that. So uh, in that um, you know, exposure training from a distance, that's really the key is that start there where, where it does work. But use food and and do lots of training sessions of that where you're in that you're far enough away to where you're just starting to see it a little bit and then you can wait for it to cease, mark and reward it, and and you're only feeding him that way. Okay, you're not doing treats on top of food or, or whatever. You're you're only feeding him during these training sessions, which means you're going to have to do these training sessions a lot because that's that's how he's eating. Um, but that that's how I would do it, and so you know you're you're getting to the point where just like a lot of the other questions that I've answered in that same capacity is that you're feeding through training, but you're doing it in this very specific environment and uh, you're slowly getting closer and closer. What I would say is I would stay in that, that area where it's working uh, for, you know, several days to, to a week, you know, really get lots, you know, dozens and dozens or even hundreds of repetitions of marking and rewarding him starting to do that and then deciding to stop himself. If that means you've got to walk him a little bit further away for it to dissipate, fine. Uh, but at first, I want it to be a conscious decision on his part, not you yelling at him or you know popping his collar or telling him no or giving him a corrective command or behavior. It's that he is deciding, right? It's one of the most key components from my perspective of, of a lot of dog training, not all of it, but I, I'm typically not a fan of you know, luring. And, and in this case, to me, it's kind of a similar principle in, in that I want the dog to, to, for him to decide. It's the same thing when I'm, if I'm walking in my backyard and he pays attention to a, a neighbor dog or something, you know, a, a duck on the other side of I mean, whatever it is, um, is that I'll let him pay attention to it. But the second he decides to come back to me, that's when it gets marked and rewarded. Then that's when they start to exercise impulse control based on, on repetition. So, Stay in that environment and slowly work your way closer and closer, but use food um, in terms of, you know, marking and rewarding and, and only feeding through training in, in that, that environment. Uh, if you could talk a bit about trends concerning dog breeds and its impacts in general. Um, this may surprise a lot of people. I have less, less of an, uh, an opinion on dog breeds, designer breeds, et cetera. Um, you know, this is one of those things where, I think, you know, a lot of times people don't mind their own business. Um, I may not like uh, or, or may, may even think it's an aberration of a breed to, to breed certain things, you know, what have you. Um, but I, I don't think that it should be illegal or, uh, or banned or anything like that. I mean, you know, again, just because I, I may not like it or agree with it doesn't mean it should be 
uh, not allowed, you know, and I think that's one of our country's biggest problems is if people don't like something, they want it to be banned or illegal. And uh, that's not how this country is supposed to work. So uh, I don't like it. I don't think it's good for the overall health and, and vitality of dog breeds as a whole. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, that, that's their prerogative. It's their right as an individual to, to kind of do what they want. I'm going to caveat it with, you know, if you're, if you're doing breedings that are so detrimental to a dog to where, you know, it's, it's dangerous for them, uh, i.e. the dog, um, you know, in terms of being able to breathe, if it's a brassiophilic issue where the dog's nose is so smushed up that, <clears throat> that the dog suffocates on its own face, then that's a problem. Um, and even with dogs, you know, if people are breeding super aggressive or super thin nerve dogs, I think it's bad. I don't think they should be doing it. Um, is it dangerous if that dog gets out and bites somebody? Yeah. Uh, but here's where instead of banning, having that happen, holding, holding people accountable that do that is really the, the key, <clears throat> you know, um, take a look at any, any federal felony and look at how many people still do it. Uh, to me, more laws or banning things aren't, aren't the problem. It's enforcing the rules that are already there. Or, you know, if your dog goes and bites somebody and, and it was an accident, then you need to get in trouble for it. It's not, oh, we're going to put the dog down and you're scot-free. It's like, no, you're in trouble for that. You know, so that's where the accountability needs to be, to be held. <clears throat> My wife has turned our staffy into a Suki... Suki, little mama's boy, how do I get rid of my wife and keep my house? <laughs> That's all on you, my man. I, uh, I hate to tell you, I, I, don't, I can't give you any advice. What I will say is um, hitting that reset button on the dog training and, and just you know going and shaping behavior and, and working with them that way, I think, is, uh, is probably your best bet. Um, I have a nine-year-old neutered Catahoula mix. He often does X-rated things to his dog bed after his meal. Is that a sign of a good dog food or something else? <laughs> uh, to me, it's just a quirk. Uh, if it's something that, that really bothers you or it's causing problems and, and you, you know, really don't want him to do that, then I would uh, correct it the same way I would anything else. You know, try to use food to extinguish it uh, or you know, use a corrective collar and, and, and just extinguish it. But uh, if he's on team dog food, then it's probably a sign of a good food. The Kohler method of dog guard dog training recommends avoiding bite work for family dog for liability reasons, but training a dog to be confident and a good decision maker and then having someone in a bite suit kick in the front of the door to see how the dog responds. Is this a feasible way of developing a guard dog for the home and family? From my uh, perspective, no. Um I would say, you know, to, to me, avoiding bite work for liability reasons, I, I think, is kind of missing the forest for the trees kind of thing. It, it, to me, it's not about that. You know, first and foremost, you know, for a dog to be truly effective as a as a bite work uh, companion animal, the genetics have to be there, plain and simple. And I will tell you that, I, you know, I can tell you with uh, confidence, ninety nine point nine percent of the dogs on the planet don't have it at that high level where the dog is legitimately going to protect you against somebody who number one is physically capable. Number two is not scared of that dog and or you. And number three is intent on hurting that dog or you. If a human individual fits those three or checks those three boxes, 99.9% .9 of the dogs on the planet don't have what it takes to deal with, with that individual. Now, Three, two, one, incoming in the comments. My dog, he ain't letting you in the house. Again, I'm going to caveat it with those three things. And the, and the biggest one is number one is that the dog is that the human is not scared, right? Most people, if they see a dog with hair up and their teeth, you know, showing and growling and barking and popping its jaws, you know, behind a door crack or behind a fence at somebody, most human beings are scared of that. Um, almost everybody is, unless they either are on something are just a rough, rough customer uh, from upbringing or whatever, or number three, has a lot of experience with working dogs and understands what's what. Um, so, you know, I, I, would, I would avoid trying to do uh, bite work with family dogs. Uh, generally speaking, you know, unless the dog is bred, raised, and trained for that and showcases their genetics and you have a high level of competency in terms of knowing what you're doing. 
I would say, you know, it's really no different than carpentry or stonemasonry or sniper work or being a high level chef. Um, you know, raising a dog for that type of work is very technical. Um, you know, it takes a lot of experience uh, and a good eye for a dog, an experienced good eye for a dog to understand if it's there or not. And if it is how you uh, utilize it, funnel it, control it, manipulate it to where you want it to be for that dog to be a protective measure for your family and household. So uh, if you don't know what you're doing, I wouldn't do it. And, you know, if it's just a regular dog that, that has none of that in their background, I wouldn't mess with it either because I think you're just going to put spiders in their head and and uh, and waste your time. So from that standpoint, yes, I would avoid doing it. Uh, I would agree with that of avoiding doing it. But um, and, and I think, you know, just training the dog to be confident and from a decision making standpoint, you know, I would disagree. I don't, I don't think you can. Uh, really control a lot on how dogs make decisions. What you can do is condition them to do certain things uh, that, that you expect of them. But <clears throat> if you want to develop a guard dog for the home and family, um, you got to you got to outsource that to a professional. The same way, like if you don't know what you're doing carpentry wise, you've never framed a house. Don't try to frame your own house. I mean, it's it's the same thing. Uh, let's see. Here, here's a question uh, asking about losing a pet uh, or toy toy poodles coming up on 18 years or time is short. At what point um, deteriorating health wise should we consider helping her cross the rainbow bridge? I already answered that. Uh, so I, I won't uh, you know, repeat myself there, but um, so just listen to the other question for the answer on that. Uh, what are your thoughts on dog DNA testing for breed and, and or health? I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, I do think, you know, I, I take it with a little bit of a grain of salt and, and I'm a little um, leery of, of the results sometimes. I don't know. I mean, it's it's hard to know how accurate it is. I mean, I, I really, I feel the same way about 23 and me or ancestry or whatever. It's like, how do you know? How do you know that that's accurate? How do you know it's not total BS? Uh, you know, or how do you know how accurate it is? You really don't. Um, so, or at least I don't. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a biologist. I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I, you know, I'm not a geneticist. I, I don't know how it works, but um, I, I'm a little skeptical of it. <clears throat> From a health standpoint, again, I, I think it's it's worth giving a shot. What I would say is, uh, again, I would be skeptical of, of a DNA test that says, hey, your dog has this precursor for this ailment, and you should just put them down because, you know, it's a matter of time. Like, I, I would not listen to a DNA test for something like that, but. <clears throat> uh, my Dutchie just turned six. He was neutered before I adopted him at two, thinking of adding a puppy this spring. He can be reactive with small dogs. I prefer a male puppy, but do you have any recommendations on sex for mixing my family as a term in, in terms of dogs? I'm always a, a bigger fan of male and female instead of two females or two males, but you know, it's not that you can't get two males or five males for that matter to get along. I just think, natural order of things and ease of transitioning a family dynamic together, you know, you're going to make your job easier, generally speaking, by doing male, female. <clears throat> uh, with a working dog, as they age, do you have any input on how to change training, upkeep training, keeping skills current to ease wear on them? Uh, also, do you try to lean them out a bit to have reduced weight on their joints? Yes and yes. Um, just like with people, you know, as dogs get older, you've got to modify, uh, their conditioning, their exercise, their training. Um, and I would use the same principle that I would use with people is that if your training sessions are so stressful and, or, um, hard on, on the dog's body to where it's, it's now, you know, limiting their ability to work after training sessions or, uh, taking away from their their efficacy as a working animal, then then you got to throttle it back. You know, it, training should always augment. You know, and and I I feel the same way about human training. I mean, yes, there are you know times where with you know either jujitsu or or just combatives training, striking, etc., or a, a weight workout where I'll push it and and go you know way above and beyond what what the workout called for. But I only do those occasionally uh, and really just to remind myself that I'm still alive and, and that, you know, there, there's a healthy perspective that, that I need to remember. Uh, Benefit-wise, 
I think it's good to do that once in a while, but just once in a while. So uh, with a dog, I think it's even less important to do those that way where occasionally you have these real big uh, kind of kick to the gut <clears throat> type of workouts that really, really challenge the dog. Um, I, I would always just try to keep it to where it's augmenting the dog and, and benefiting them, not, not detracting. Um, I would always, for, for their entire life, I would try to keep them lean, just like with people. Uh, any extra weight is, is going to be bad for everything, not just for their joints. It's going to be bad for their internal organs, their heart, uh, their, you know, their cardiovascular system, their, their ability to work, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, hi, Mike. We have a three year old GSD. Fairly high prey drive, reactive to other dogs. I follow other dog trainers and have used uh, and used their techniques. Leave it changing direction, calling them to me, etc. He is reactive to some commercials as well. Uh, any tips? I have 12 of your dog training videos and they've helped with many issues, but I'm struggling. Uh, I would hit the reset button with him. I would, you know, the online videos, I'm assuming you mean the team dog videos, the team dog dot pet. If not, I would sign up there and I would do a full reset. Uh, you know, just hit the reset button and start from scratch with the structure video and, and all of the videos after it. Um, you know, to me, anytime, you know, if a dog is, you've had them for a few years and, and you know, you've hit a plateau or even taken a few steps back and you're, and you're kind of hitting walls and, and, you know, your training methodology seems to just ha have hit a stall point, I always recommend hitting a reset for, you know, three, four weeks of crating while not training, feeding through training, you know, really working, working on that focus piece and, and just kind of, you know, again, re resetting the dog a little bit and, and going from there. Um, I don't have any questions, but two weeks about two weeks ago, we got the micro online training. That's a team dog dot pet. It's an unbelievable game changer. Thank you. Glad to hear it. Uh, Mike Wrigley, my nearly eight year old golden retriever is my sixth golden. I've never known a more intelligent, capable and confident canine. He is to me, what I suspect your shepherd was to you. Um, Wrigley knew that I had cancer before I did. That was almost four years ago at this point. <clears throat> Since then, he watches my every move, always by my side. Since cancer struck, uh, he's shown some an anxiety, both behavior as well as a very sensitive stomach. Um, bottom line, try to make things as normal as possible. Question, how can I best help him to relax a wee bit and better understand that we'll continue to fight this thing and win? I have anti-anxiety meds for him, but use them sparingly as they turn him into a glazed over lump of fur. Um, to me, I, you know, first off, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your cancer. Um, second, at the risk of sounding like a dick, um, I, I do think you're anthropomorphizing a little bit. Um, you know, I, I think it has more to do with, he, he can tell something's wrong, um, you know, but I, I think the best thing that you can do is, is try not to focus on any of that and just have fun with them. You know, um, I know that's sometimes easier said than done, especially if you're sick. And again, I'm not trying to be uh, unsensitive or insensitive to it rather, but, um, how can you help them relax? Again, to me, the, the biggest thing is, is work with them, train with them to the best of your ability physically. I know you're, you know, you're probably under the weather more than, than historically. And that, that could be part of it too. Try to keep the routine that you guys had prior to you finding out that you had cancer and, and it altering uh, whatever it's altered in your life. Try try to get back to that sense of normal to the best of your ability, and try to do engaging things with him. Where you know whether it's playing ball with a chucket or uh, a little bit of light tug or uh, brain games. You know, on the online training, I've got a, a whole. Uh, game section to, to help work their mind if it's bad weather or, you know, physically you can't do certain things with them outside. Letting them use their mind and figure things out and shaping inadvertent or uh, irrelevant behaviors is uh, is beneficial. Uh, so I, I would try to do that. Um, and, and again, just try not to worry too much. Try not to focus on it. If you see him <clears throat> uh, acting a certain way, don't, don't change anything you're doing. Just kind of ignore it. I mean, it's kind of like you know, when you see parents at, at a, a playground and their kid falls off off of a slide or whatever and they, you know, smack their face on the ground and they look at you, right? And then the mom's like, oh, my God, honey, come here. You know, and then the kid starts fucking bawling. On the other side, if it's like, you know, of course, then the dad's like, rub some dirt on it and shut up, you know. And then the kid's like, oh, all right, well, I guess we're just back to normal. It, there, there is a component of that. Uh, you know, where dogs are, are going to feed off of your vibe and energy and, and it's important to... Uh, to, to keep that in mind. So I would do that to the best of your ability. 
All right, the working drive in your dogs is important. Would the breed work livestock? Hunt by scent, so smart. I guess any fella could train them to do anything. Not sure what your question is other than would they breed, would the breed work livestock? Uh, they can. I mean, that's originally what they were used for. Now, granted, it's been a while since the herders uh, have been used to herd, but uh, with their prey drive and stuff, I mean, are they going to work naturally as good as a Australian cattle dog or uh you know, something, you know, more traditional in, in that sense? No. Uh, can you teach them to do it and, and probably do it well? Yeah, absolutely. If you start from scratch and that's your goal with them, 100%. Um, all right, thanks for letting us post questions. Um, retired law enforcement with a three-year-old high-drive male shepherd. Outstanding companion, loves to work and learn new things. Recently started to growl from time to time at our 19-year-old daughter if she comes to the master bedroom around bedtime or if she's around his kennel. Once he was loving on me after getting back from a trip, when she came to give me a hug, he growled at her then. Maybe I shouldn't have, but he got his ass tore up for that, just trying to figure out how to fix this. If she's home alone with him, they get along like best buddies. I'm confused. Any help is appreciated. Uh, a couple things. Uh, number one is I would say, um, you know, being cognizant of that and preemptively kind of addressing it, right? So, um, you know, when you start to see any little change in behavior, and you'll usually see it, you know, before the dog growls or gets up or, you know, has a very, um, you know, outgoing uh, behavior that, that makes you understand that they're not comfortable or, or they're growly or whatever, you'll usually see a, a shift, a very subtle but slight shift in behavior uh, first. Um it's at that moment where you say, I, I, you know, hey, knock it off, et cetera. I, I, would, I would say I would also pair that with using a dog bed um, and, and having him go to his dog bed as kind of a routine. If she's going to come give you a hug, tell him to go lay down on his dog bed and then have her come in and give you a hug and, and go through kind of that methodical approach at first. Uh, try to desensitize, you know, his attachment or, or his issue boundary wise with being close to you or her being close to you and you kind of giving him guidance. Think of it no different than, you know, if you've got two kids that aren't getting along or one's being mean to the other one, the older one's being mean to the younger one, et cetera. Uh, you know, you need to regulate that. So now don't go overboard. And as you put it, uh, tore his ass up be preemptive, send him over to a dog bed, send him away from you, have her come in, you know, and then have him come over or keep him there, you know, just desensitize him that way and, and work on that for a few weeks where you're very intentional and particular about your interactions with her around him. Very structured um, and, and just, you know, stick, stick with that. Last question, dog allergies and gut health. Um, just like with people, Dog allergies and gut health is generally uh, or generally stems from what they eat and uh, or what they don't eat. And so, um, you know, just like within people, you know, we eat a lot of things that that our bodies and in particular our gut slash stomach is not designed to process. What happens over time is that creates uh, fissures or, or micro tears in your stomach lining, et cetera. And then whatever you eat, particles of that breaks through that, that barrier and gets into your bloodstream and then your body reacts as though it's allergic to it. It has an immuno response. And that's why now all of a sudden, oh, there's all these people allergic to peanuts or, or whatever is that, you know, it's because they're eating processed oils and, um, you know, glyfo glyphosate covering and everything. I mean, I, I honestly don't think it's as much about gluten as it is all the pesticides and, and shit that's, that's poisoning us that's on a lot of the products that, that we're eating that's causing these problems in our gut. So number one is getting rid of, um, you know, all of those types of things in a dog's diet. I mean, one of the things with the team dog food, um, as you'll notice, there's no corn, wheat, or soil, soil, soy, uh, there's no gluten or seed oils. Um, to me, th those two things usually are hand in hand. And, and also products that have gluten in them usually have uh, pesticides that, that are so invasive to, uh, to the farming industry uh, into those products that it's it's in the the final products triscuits as an example you know the, the tests that um, that you can do on on 
you know, a lot of those products that have gluten in them have a lot of pesticides, uh, you know, in them as well. And that, I think that's causing more problems, but so, um, the best thing you can do is, is feed a really high quality food and, and don't give them anything treats, uh, treats wise or supplements wise that has any of the, the gut inflammation problem products or, uh, you know, things like that, that are, that are inherently going to cause problems in a, in a dog's body. So, Obviously, I recommend my team dog food, the essential blend, the elite blend, as well as the new blend that we've got coming out, uh, you know, early in the in 2024 that I'm excited to launch here uh, in the coming months. But uh, that's really the gist of it. You know, just like with people, um, if you if you eat really clean and and take care of yourself, the uh, the allergy and gut gut problems tend to go away pretty quick. So um I appreciate you guys tuning in. I uh, hope that was helpful. Um, I encourage you to go to teamdog.pet. All of the questions that I answered uh, are, are on there in, in video format, and, and I get on the forums and answer questions every week uh, if you have any other further questions or what have you, so I recommend doing that. Um, keep tuning in. Thank you for your support. Uh, go to teamdog.pet. Uh, get you, you can get Team Dog food. You can get it on Chewy. You can get it on Amazon. You can go to uh, the team dog website and, and buy it direct from us. Um, you know, lots of places you can get it, but we're going to have some new treats coming out. We do have uh, lots of different treats. We've got supplements, as you can see here, we've got skin and coat, digestive and hip and joint formula. Uh, we've got beef nibs, turkey bites, salmon skins, um, a, a host of different products. So I encourage you to check it all out. Thank you for the support. And until next time, this is Mike Drop.